you know, some of the new things on the horizon, and I'll actually just start at the top. I'm not sure how much we can uh, see back behind me. I took a page out of Dr. Hart's uh, book and uh, wanted to use the whiteboard to uh, demonstrate some of this so that it's not death by PowerPoint, now it's death by whiteboard. No, it looks great, actually. Well, thank you. Uh, I do not have the penmanship that Dr. Hart has, I found, as I was trying to write up there. So at any rate, I'll take lessons from him later. We'll figure that out and get this all worked out. But. Lumbopelvic fixation is something that we've utilized in the deformity world for quite some time. And I think before you even embark on this discussion of what's out there, what's new out there, et cetera, it becomes important to, to ask ourselves, why do we even do lumbopelvic fixation? And uh, if we back up to that kind of theoretical point, um, you know, I think the answer largely is that as we develop longer and longer constructs, we're putting more and more stress across two uh, important anatomical structures. The first of those is the sacrum itself. And so we do lumbopelvic fixation to avoid that dreaded sacral U fracture, which in my mind, my mind is iatrogenic if we fail to do our lumbopelvic fixation on a long construct. And it can be incredibly incapacitating for the patient. And preventing the sacral U fracture is far better than trying to surgically repair the sacral U fracture. The other uh, anatomic structure that has a fair amount of stress placed across it with these long constructs is the sacroiliac joint. And so I want to talk about both of these and the rationale behind using lumbopelvic fixation. The shortest construct that I've ever seen a sacral U fracture on a patient was an L3 to S1. And it was obviously a patient with not very good bone quality. But these are the things that you want to keep in the forefront of your mind as you're putting together your surgical plan and saying, how am I going to avoid these potential complications? So I did my fellowship training here in Seattle several, uh, well, just over about a decade and a half or so ago now. And our primary lumbopelvic fixation at that time was what you see number one there, the iliac screws. And uh, we became quite good at these. There was a certain degree of uh, machismo associated with the length of that iliac screw. And uh, it was a very solid form of fixation. We know that there are issues with the iliac screw fixation. One of those is that it does not typically line up very well with the rest of the screw rod construct. And so in minimally invasive scenarios, it makes rod passage almost impossible. Um, and uh, even when we're uh, passing a rod in an open scenario, often we have to use offsets. And my general feeling is that the more uh, instrumentation we have in the back, the more likely we have for failure. Also, iliac screws are prominent, and this is a common uh, complaint by the patient. Um, dual iliac screws are used often in trauma scenarios, also sometimes in uh, deformity. Uh, since that time, we've talked more and more about S2 ALAR iliac trajectory screws that are going to come in with a starting point, roughly the same position that you'd put your S1 pedicle screw, uh, as far as the medial lateral starting point on the sacrum itself. Obviously, the starting point is in the S2 vertebral body or the ala itself. And this particular screw then transitions across the sacroiliac joint, giving more points of fixation, because we have our near cortex in the sacrum, we have our far cor sacral cortex, our near iliac cortex, and then ending in that nice solid bone above the acetabulum. Um, some people, I've seen this described, it hasn't been reported on in the literature as far as uh, I've been able to see long-term studies yet, but S1 ALAR iliac fixation is also starting to come to the forefront, especially in individuals that are using intraoperative navigation, uh, making the trajectory for an S1 ALAR iliac screw a little bit more easy. And often these are used in combination. So if someone places an S1 ALAR iliac screw, they can also place an S2 ALAR iliac screw to get better uh, pelvic anchoring of your uh, construct. And then uh, one of the things that I'm going to demonstrate today is this posterior sacroiliac joint fusion device. There's only one on the market that I'm currently aware of, and that's put out by SI Bone, and it's termed the bedrock device, very similar to the iFuse device. And so your workflow for each of these uh, is dependent on sort of the tools that you have available at your hospital. What we're going to demonstrate today is fluoroscopy. Um, with fluoroscopy, obviously, I rely very heavily on my outlet view and my teardrop view to place these. And uh, you can do this same fluoroscopic views for percutaneous uh, pelvic fixation. And then, obviously, 
uh, ushered into the world and already demonstrated to us today are things like navigation and robotic assistance, which uh, continues to make this process a little more straightforward. Um, if we look at these, I want to talk just briefly about the, the, the other drawbacks. I mentioned that the iliac screws can be prominent. Uh, they don't line up well with our fixation. But the other issue with an iliac screw is that it's typically a very good foundation. And what we see uh, over time as we follow folks with this sword uh, type of lumbopelvic fixation is that they can have fracture of the rod between the S1 and the iliac, sac uh, iliac screw. And the, the disadvantage of that, obviously, is you've lost the uh, benefit of that pelvic fixation. And then we're back to being concerned about a sacral U fracture or strain on the, uh, the SI joint. Um, with S2 ALAR iliac trajectory screws, this is a screw that goes across a joint. And it is parallel to the center of rotation of that joint. And so there are all sorts of problems associated with that in which you see loosening that screw, either on the iliac side or on the sacral side. And I've seen screw fracture happen as a result of a screw across a joint that is not otherwise fused, in this case, the SI joint. Um, and then, of course, the posterior SI joint fusion. There was a great article that actually just came out uh, by uh, Dr. Uribe, in which they did the biomechanical study combining first just iliac screws versus S2 ALAR iliac screws versus S2 ALAR iliac screws and the posterior SI joint fusion. And there's 30% less range of motion by adding the bedrock device across the sacroiliac joint along with your S2 ALAR iliac screw when compared to S2 ALAR iliac fixation by itself. And so again, the likelihood of failure of the distal portion of the construct is less as we reduce that motion significantly and essentially affect a fusion. So I want to get into how we do this. Any of you familiar with S2 ALAR iliac trajectory screws, this is going to be fairly straightforward for you. Um, for those of you that are not, um, I, we'll go ahead and uh, sort of demonstrate. I've already placed our S2 ALAR iliac screw in place so you can get an idea of what that looks like. And then we'll utilize that to help us put in the SI joint fusion device or the bedrock. So I like to start with a pelvic outlet view. And the advantage of the pelvic outlet view is that I can see the S1 vertebral body, the S1 ala, the S2 vertebral body, the S2 ala, and of course the S12 neural foramen. And so if you see, that's, uh, that's our teardrop image. Can we get, uh, there we go. And uh, so this is a very good inlet view in which this S2 ALAR iliac screw is already in. You can see the starting point for that S2 ALAR iliac screw is right in line with where my S1 pedicle screw would be. And again, the advantage to this fixation is it facilitates rod passage with fewer failure points with lateral connectors or otherwise. Um, just barely above that S2 ALAR iliac screw is the S12 neural foramen through which the S1 nerve root exits the spinal canal. And so I go just lateral to that S12 neural foramen for the start point of this supplementary SI joint fusion device. And so you can see there on this outlet view the S1 neural foramen, and I'm just lateral to that now proximal to my S2 ALAR iliac fixation. And here I'm just using a pedicle probe. Um, and what I like to do radiographically is line up essentially parallel to my S2 ALAR iliac screw. Let's go ahead and convert to the teardrop, and I want to show you a couple pearls here. Once I've established my start point, then I go to my teardrop image. Let's go ahead and look at that. And again, the pearl that I want to convey as best as possible is the placement of that S2 ALAR iliac bolt. So typically, we think when we're not doing supplementary fixation that putting that thing right in the middle of the teardrop is advantageous. And uh, the issue with that, if we're doing supplementary, in this case, the bedrock or even S1 ALAR iliac trajectory fixation, is we need more real estate. So we have uh, taken care of that problem by placing this S2 ALAR iliac bolt in the lower one third of the teardrop. And once I've got this projection here and I know my starting point, which is well visualized, then I'm able to go ahead and drive my pedicle probe down. And we're going to go ahead and do that now. And I'm going to continually check that teardrop image. So 
to make sure that we've transitioned across the SI joint, and now we're in sort of that middle one-third of the teardrop. Go ahead and go north a little bit. And I'm just sending it down fairly well at that point. And I like as best as possible with this fixation, uh, if necessary, to even engage the lateral cortex of the ilium. And so if I even start with a flatter trajectory to drive this device down and I engage with the outer table of the ilium, I think that's quite good. In this case, like I say, I'm right in the middle of the teardrop. We're in a radiographically safe zone. And so I don't need to worry about impinging on any structures. I'm clearly across the SI joint at this juncture. And I'm just going to go ahead and remove the pedicle probe. And I'm going to replace it with a guide pin. And I can even drive that guide pin in a little bit further if I need to, um, just through that uh, bone above the acetabulum. Go ahead. And uh, we can measure off this. Now, again, I'm not 100% certain where the end of this pin is right now. And you can see it's actually much deeper as I just allowed it to go in through the cortical bone. But we're measuring here. And the way you want to look at this, I don't know how well you can see this, is that this line is going to fall. And in this case, if this were my actual measurement, and again, we're still not quite through the radiographic teardrop, I would go ahead and put in potentially a 70 millimeter device based on what I'm measuring here. Um, in this case, we have a 75 millimeter device available. So that's what's going to be perfect for this patient's anatomy. There is a soft tissue protector. And the alignment of the soft tissue protector in this case is also important. And I don't know how well you can see up above. But what I'm doing is I'm putting the flat surface of this triangular shaped soft tissue projector, uh, protector <laughs> against the S12 neural foramen. And so that way, I'm not impinging on any of the dorsal innervation of this area. And to help this, we're going to, through that soft tissue protector, go ahead and use a drill. And the drill is marked according to the lines, essentially in reference to the end of the soft tissue protector. So right now, I'm sitting at about 20 millimeters of depth. I want to make sure that I drive this all the way across the sacroiliac joint. The danger in doing this is that you can pull this guide pin out. But the advantage now that I've made this reasonably large hole is that I can get that guide pin. Right, do you have another pin? We've got it retrieved here. And I'll just go ahead and drop it right back down the hole again. And then I'll use my soft tissue protector again. And we'll use a brooch. And the brooch just widens the hole that was made by the drill. It is also triangular in shape, so it's going to accommodate the geometry of the implant itself. And then with the path of least resistance, meaning that I do not want to bind on this guide wire, I want to follow it down. And one of the things we can do is we can check that radiographic teardrop. I'm not quite sure if it'll fit in. Get as close as you can, and we'll see. Yeah, let's see what that gives us. Yeah, unfortunately, we're still just a little bit uh, superior here. So go ahead and go up north again. We'll go ahead and drive this across. And the portion that you'll get bound up the most is as it's coming across the sacroiliac joint. So you should be able, hopefully, to come on down there and check that. So here, we're going to go ahead and drop this off. We'll check our pin, make sure our pin's in the right spot. And I don't know how well you can see inside the wound. If we could zoom in a little bit, but we have the triangular shaped entry point now that uh, was created by the trocar. And now again, just lateral to the S12 neural foramen. We can place our 3D printed titanium device across that SI joint. And 
And you can check this along as we're going down. Let's make sure that we didn't move in our trajectory that much. And again, we see it landing right in that middle third. And you can put it in the middle to upper third. And the advantage of this device, then, is that it's going to sit underneath your rod as it comes from your S1 pedicle screw to your S2 Alar iliac bolt and not really obstruct um, your ability to affect uh, reduction of the deformity, et cetera, et cetera, whereas it gives us another point of fixation across the SI joint. So let's check another teardrop now that we have it flush with the S2 ALA. Sorry, a little further south. And there we are. And so again, we're getting closer to engaging with that lateral border. And so this is, like I say, a very new technology. Um, we have the biomechanical study, which has already been authored by Dr. Oribe, and shows that this reduces the range of motion across the SI joint. The question becomes, how clinically relevant is this? And so that brings us to a prospective randomized controlled study in which we're involved in right now, uh, still collecting patients in which we're going to randomize them prospectively and blinded into the S2 ALAR iliac trajectory pelvic fixation and then the S2 ALAR iliac trajectory with the addition of an SI fusion device or the bedrock device. And what we're looking for specifically is SI joint related pain and other sources of failure of our more common lumbopelvic fixation. And again, so what we're trying to avoid is, in the case of using iliac screws, rod breakage between the S1 pedicle screw and the iliac screw. And then in the case of S2 alar iliac fixation, preventing screw breakage and uh, controlling the uh, range of motion across the SI joint so that we don't see loosening within either the iliac or the sacral portion of the SI joint. And it's been exciting to gather this data and to see patients' responses to it thus far. I have in many cases, even with good S2 alar iliac trajectory fixation or dual uh, lumbopelvic fixation, seen patients after their, say, T10 to pelvis or otherwise, develop sacroiliac joint dysfunction and pain and what I'm hoping over time is that we prevent that from occurring. In those cases, I've used then a lateral to medial trajectory SI joint fixation uh, or the standard primary SI joint fixation to remedy that. If we can prevent that from occurring so that we don't need to return to the operating room, that will be very advantageous for our patients. So I would love to open it up for questions. Uh, feel free to ask questions about any of these lumbopelvic fixation strategies. Yeah, Dr. Kent, uh, thank you so much. Um, that's uh, such a nice uh, kind of demonstration of that additional implant across uh, the SI joint. And like you said, uh, hopefully it will yield some increased biomechanical uh, strength through the studies done. A couple questions um, uh, that were asked is, one was, um, do, you, do you like to use these in trauma cases uh, or in addition to the DGEN cases uh, like, for example, deformity. How, in other words, have you used it in anything other than deformity? So my main experience in the trauma world uh, is when we use triangular osteosynthesis for a traumatic sacral U fracture is iliosacral bolts uh, that was described you know, years ago at Harborview by uh, Thomas Shieldhauer and then with work uh, that was also done with Chip Route and Sean Nork, et cetera. And uh, so uh, the, the quick answer to your question is no. I'm not sure that it has the same biomechanical effect as a triangular osteosynthesis uh, construct in which I'm still using dual iliac bolt fixation as far as my lumbo uh, I'm, my lumbo-pelvic fixation and then augmenting that with uh, anterior iliosacral screws. But I definitely imagine a world, and especially with uh, some of the even more uh, advanced uh, implants that are coming out in which we'll convert our iliosacral screws, uh, you know, either S1 or S2 or both, I tend to use both in the trauma world, um, to a 3D printed implant that allows for uh, bony ingrowth and ongrowth to really get bone across that fracture site. But so no, I haven't used this particular uh, method uh, for trauma, uh, nor has it been indicated for that. I think there was one, one other question. Dr. Arlette was uh, asking for your take on percutaneous iliosacral fixation uh, here. Um, you know, in addition to, to, the, to the implant you demonstrate, just your, your take on percutaneous uh, fixation. 
Yeah, um, so I'm assuming you know, that's a question regarding, say, S1 and S2 iliosacral bolts. Um, you know, my biggest issue with that fixation, uh, I'm sorry, uh, maybe I should have you clarify, is that for SI joints? No, it's, 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 it's just for the uh, fusion of the sacroiliac joints. Uh, yeah. you, you go uh, through the joint from the inside out, and how about uh, going percutaneously uh, like uh, a regular SI fusion, now it's, uh, how it's done uh, currently? Yeah. Um, when a lot of times when you look at the CT scans of this sort of posterior medial to, po to anterior lateral approach coming in through the back, uh, we're already there obviously when we're doing our deformity cases. I do not believe that this necessarily should be or could be or we have enough data to support this being the workhorse of primary SI joint fusion at this juncture. Um, the advantage of this device obviously is that it has other stabilization throughout the spine and then into the ilium with the S2 alar iliac screw. Um, but for primary SI joint fixation, uh, I use the iliosacral approach most commonly. Um, and there are several devices out there that work very well. I think our best data is with our triangular shaped devices and uh, we're gathering more and more data on different implants. But I, I believe that should still be the workhorse especially according to the NAS recommendations and ISAS recommendations for primary SI joint fusion. I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's great. Um, we had one, one more question from the audience. How do you prevent distal screw exposure risk in, uh, in adolescent uh, lumbar sacral spondees uh, with, with a large, dis large displacement, presumably, uh, you know, between the L5 and S1 vertebrae? Um, any so, tips? I, I'm guessing in this question we're talking about the prominence of the screw itself. Right, exactly. So that's the advantage of the S2 alar iliac fixation is a lot of times this is actually going to be deeper than your posterior superior iliac spine. And so I use that as my reference, especially in these high grade, um, you know, spondylolisthesis, a grade four, grade five spondylolisthesis in a young person. As long as I'm below that posterior superior iliac spine, I think that's perfectly reasonable. And I haven't had a patient have a symptomatic S2 alar iliac screw to this point as long as I was deep to the posterior superior iliac spine of the pelvis itself. Um, thankfully, in that population, uh, osteoporosis is not usually a problem, so the likelihood of that screw backing out even across a heavily lordosed construct is very low, and I haven't seen that occur just because of the quality of bone in the young patient. Um, does Dr. Linke have a question? I think his hand is raised. Is he on? Well, while we're waiting, let me ask a question. Were, were you in the yep. room? Were you in the room? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't have a question. Sorry, huh. didn't, didn't mean to raise my hand. Sorry. Did you have a question? No, no. Oh, okay. Excellent uh, um, conversation. All right. Well, we're about ready to kind of move on. We're right on time. But let me ask. Uh, I've been curious since the the procedure, the bedrock procedure, got named. Any relation to the Flintstones? Uh, that's a great question, and I don't think I'm actually qualified to answer that. It never came to me to ask, so I like it. I like that story. If we were to develop that, Scott, I think that would be important. Uh, yeah, I got to. I got to find out. There may be some copyright infringements. So we better be careful. <laughs> yeah, maybe the maybe the uh, the copyright has run out by now. <laughs> well, thank thank you. It was a great presentation and lab, and you know, multitasking is.